Amen. Uh, this being Epiphany Sunday in the life of the church, we're going to be sharing in our message today from what is very much the traditional passage for Epiphany, and that is from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there, or, or you can also see it on the screen as well. But let's hear how, how God moved in the lives of Magi who were seeking Him, that we might as well. So, hear the Word of God. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where's the one who's been born King of the Jews? We saw a star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ, which means Messiah, anointed one, was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. And as soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. And after they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. And let us bow as we go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we know that your word is living and true. It's a word for our lives, not to just give us good advice, but it's the living word of who you are, Jesus, that you might live in us and that we might bow in adoration as the Magi would and did that day so that we can worship you and you can live in us and we can walk in a new way. We pray, come Holy Spirit now and, and uh, lead and guide us and, and come and live in us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to begin by saying Merry Epiphany Sunday to everybody. And also, Happy Epiphany Day, which would be tomorrow, January 6th. Now, how many of you think that kind of sounds weird? to say that, saying it like Merry Christmas. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn to someone next to you, in front of you, behind you, and first of all, tell them this, Merry Epiphany Sunday. Say that to your... And now say, and, and now say this, Happy Epiphany Day. It's kind of a tongue twister in itself, and how many thought that was a little strange saying that? Well, Sometimes in the United States, we might think it's kind of strange about this epiphany. But for Christendom around the world, the holy day of epiphany, January 6th, is just as celebrated as Christmas Day. And in some ways, it's almost even a higher celebration. So what is epiphany? What does that word mean? The Greek word means manifestation. Or here's a key word, to appear or another key word about epiphany is theophany. And a theophany was like in the Old Testament when there was a Christ figure type of appearance like there was to Abram. Uh, that's also kind of the epiphany, if you want to say that. In Western Christianity, epiphany is the day to commemorate principally the visit of the Magi to the Christ child in Bethlehem, thus representing Jesus' physical, don't miss this, manifestation of Christ to the Gentiles. It was that first physical manif manifestation of those who had come from other countries. And it was the recognition of Jesus' div divinity and his deity. And that Jesus is for all the people of all nations. Now, in, in the Eastern Orthodox Christianity, it's kind of interesting, we had, a, we had a song about baptism. They actually, on the 6th, celebrate about the baptism of Jesus. And that came as he was, again, uh, the word meaning to appear. As he appeared, it was the beginning of his ministry as he was baptized, he being the Messiah, the Son of God. And when he was baptized, he was literally heading to the cross when he's baptized. So it's the revelation of who Jesus is, and you sung about baptism Next Sunday is also Baptism of the Lord's Sunday as you put those two uh, together and, and that. Now, I want to share a couple of things around the world. Now, for Epiphany Sunday, we basically put the name in the bulletin, right? And we read, you know, from the, the Magi story. 
But around the world, they do some interesting customs. You can go online and read about them. Just a couple of those are these. In Germany, there's groups of young people called Stern Singers, one word, Stern Singers, or that means star singers who dress up as the wise men. They have their leader who carries the star before them, and they go house to house singing songs, which is kind of like Christmas caroling, which we enjoy doing. And so they bless the folks that they go to with songs about Christ. And, and here's the good thing for them. They often get offered treats for their singing. That's the good part of caroling I like as well, you know, getting offered those treats. But, but, a, but an interesting part of that tradition is they ask for donations for worthy causes. That might be to help the needy, to help the poor, homeless, and whoever. It's a, it's a neat tradition of the, the idea of the Magi bringing gifts to Christ to be used for His kingdom. Now, one of the ones that I found out more about, because someone that goes to this church has been there and experienced that, is what happens in Spain. And uh, I got to talk to Fivot. Is it Fivot? Am I saying that? Hey, say that again. Fivox, yeah. Fivox was here, is here visiting with Joanna and, and Tim Totten, and he's been in Spain, and he said, I want to tell you, in Spain, this is a huge day, January 6th, they call it, in fact, Three Kings Day, and they have a huge parade in the towns and the main towns and uh, there, and, and in the parade, they have three persons who dress up as the wise men or the kings as they've come to be known. And they'll come in on camels, literally experiencing the journey, representing the discovery of Jesus, finding Jesus as well, and that journey coming to that end of seeing who Jesus is. Now, I was reading more about that, and sometimes they'll come in with a, a horse, and they'll come in on a camel and an elephant, representing that they're coming from Arabia, the Orient, and Africa, or from the nations of the world that have come now to the Christ child. So, kind of interesting, but Fivats. What he said to me was this. He said, on Christmas Day, the kids just get some chocolates and treats. But it's epiphany that they share their gifts in recognition of the wise men sharing. What I liked about the, the Spanish way of celebrating that is the representation of the journey that the Magi were on. And that was a long journey that they had to make to seek and find Jesus. And so we're going to look at that, journeying with the wise men. Uh, to the new year, or to the new, if we want to say it that way. Now, who were the Magi from the East? Basically, what, just from studies and things and looking back in those times and periods, Magi, the word, actually means wise men. And that's what the, the Greek word means. They were probably, we believe, from Babylon, Persia, or even further East. Some believe they might have been priests, priests from the tribes that would serve the Persian kings. But Generally, what they say about the Magi were these things. They were men, they were very learned. They were skilled in philosophy, skilled in science, the study of stars or astronomy, we might call that. They were oftentimes known as men of wisdom and holiness, interpreters of dreams, which is interesting with what happens in this. They study books oftentimes for references to the future and future events. And these were Magi. Now, what's interesting, if the Magi were from around Babylon and east in that direction, there's lots of Jewish people who had been dispersed or taken captive by Babylon. So there's a huge Jewish community, which meant Scripture was there. And it's very possible that as they're studying the things of the, of the future, they're studying actually Scriptures and the prophecies even about Jesus. Whether they actually did that or not, we do know they're going to see Scripture later when they get to Jerusalem. But uh, it's interesting about who these wise men are coming from the East. I find, uh, actually, in, in the study of the Bible, you'll often find that the enemy to Israel often came from the East. And now they're coming from the East to come to the one who reconciles people uh, in Jesus Christ. So it's another interesting side about coming from the East. Now, the shepherds, we know, received a direct invitation. How would you like to get a direct invitation from an angel to come and see the, the Messiah, Christ the Lord, the Savior who's been born? Well, they got a direct invitation. The, the Magi get a star. They get a sign, if we want to say, from God. Um, and in their time, if, if, especially the ones who studied the stars, when they saw a super bright star, it was said that a king had been born somewhere. 
And that was part of who they were in just thinking of the star that way. Um, as we think of the star that leads the, the wise men to Jesus, a lot of people have conjectured things like it could have been Halley's Comet back then, but actually it doesn't come in that time period. It could have been the lining up of planets and the supernova and all these kind of things. But the Gospel writer Matthew essentially says this, it was a supernatural thing brought on by God. Um, oftentimes, God works through the natural and does something supernatural as well. God speaks to us through nature, His first witness to us through His design of nature. But in this case, a sign of the star that the Magi see. Now, what's interesting, we'll find out later, they might not have always seen it all the time, and we'll look at that in a moment. But what I see that, that is neat about the Magi coming to Jesus are, are three things. And one of those is this. The, the Magi took great perseverance in finding Jesus, in searching for Jesus. Matthew simply says it this way. Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who is born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. One small sentence. We read it this time of year, almost every year, during the Christmas season and story. One small sentence, but that small phrase represented a trip that if they were from Babylon or Persia, that was over a thousand miles. It's, it's 500 miles as a crow flies from ancient Babylon to Jerusalem. It was further by the trade routes because you couldn't walk straight there. You had to go around the geography. It was a thousand miles. Now you imagine in that day and time, Mary and Joseph had a journey, about 60 miles, remember, from Nazareth to Bethlehem, and about several, maybe several hundred going over to Egypt when they were fleeing. But the Magi would have had at least a trip probably of a thousand miles. They risked leaving their own country. They risked traveling. In the time of Jesus, we know there were bandits all the time. There was harshness of weather. Um, they persevered greatly and kept seeking and going on to see Jesus. Now, I compare that to myself sometimes, and maybe us. Like, for example, sometimes we just have trouble waking up, right, in the morning, or, or hitting the alarm clock or maybe turning over for the, the snooze for nine minutes, or whatever it is, or, man, now i got to take a shower, or get something to eat, and my goodness, I've got to drive five miles to get to church. <laughs> and then I think of the wise men who went through what they did out of their obedience, one, to God and the sign to seek Jesus. Jeremiah spoke a word to us, and he speaks it to us today, and it's Jeremiah 29, 13. It's going to be coming up on the screen. It says, you will seek me and find me, read it with me, when you seek me with all your heart. You can go through the prophets, through the Proverbs, Proverbs 8, 17 says, I love those who love me and those who seek me, find me. And if anybody was seeking God, I believe with all their hearts, it was the Magi. I mean, to go the extent that they went to see Jesus and to worship Him. Now, Sometimes in my life, I get to where I don't go to such extents. I don't know about you. I'm not always seeking. Sometimes I start things well and don't always continue things or stop them for a while. We might be kind of like this famous uh, uh, painter. Uh, he also was an inventor and drawer and did all kinds of things. Um, that painting is called The Adoration of the Magi. Um, and, a, and a young man aged, aged 29 in 1480, a long time back, was hired basically by a monastery, San Donato, is that right? San Donato Monastery to do an eight foot by nine foot picture of the Magi coming to worship Jesus. And that's what you see in the front. They're bowed in the front. Uh, anybody want to take a guess who that person might have been? That, that he was a great he was a very wise man and inventor. So Leonardo da Vinci, who was 29 years old, he's commissioned. And he worked on this for a while. But then one day he just put his brush down, and that was that. And he left, and he went to Milan. And he never painted another stroke on that picture. He got the concept in. He got kind of the browns and the yellows, they say, in the, the story. It's a masterpiece now, but he never finished it. Um, some say the reason he didn't finish is because he kind of had a little run-in about how much money he was going to get paid for it by the monks and didn't feel like he was being treated very good and might have had a good reason to go to Milan. 
But, but they also say this about da Vinci. He had a reputation as being unreliable at completing commissioned works that he was paid to do like this. He loved spending months on the concept. And if you look in that picture closely, if you go online and look at it, there's all kinds of deep theology behind the scene. And you can't see it all, but it's kind of like the fall of Rome back there on the, on the stairs. And, and the, I think the horsemen are in there. All kinds of things that he put in there. It's an incredible concept about, behind who Jesus is. But he would do that, and, and he loved the concept and work on that. You know what he didn't like to do? He really didn't like to paint. <laughs> he didn't like to complete the painting. And so the picture painting called Adoration of the Magi, he never finished. But the Magi, in their perseverance, went to where Jesus was. They made it all, sometimes I'm kind of more like Da Vinci, you know. Um, How many of you have New Year's resolutions? Raise your hand. One, raise your hand. Okay, two, okay, two. There was none in the first service. And I thought, you guys are really smart. You don't have any resolutions, so don't break any resolutions, right? Well, I've, I've started one, not necessarily a resolution, but I, I've started going back to the gym. And, and I've, I've worked out two days this year in, what, five now or five? Last year, all last year, I worked out two days, <laughs> all last year. And, and here was the motivator. One, I just started thinking, man, I've got to get a hold. I've let myself go, you know. I gotta, and I'm serious about it. I've got to get a hold of it. So, but two, Kerry, when he was here, he used the membership, and he's in Nashville now, and I started thinking about how much that was costing me to pay for that membership. And so those were kind of the motivators. Now, I tell that story to say this. I don't always feel like going to work out. In fact, sometimes I feel really tired. But what I've discovered is if I go, and if I continue to do it, and persist in it, every time I've gone to work out, I always feel better after I've gone. I have to do elliptical now because I can't, you know, I've had a hip replacement but, and those kind of things. But man, I just, I feel so much better. But there's times, literally, I have to encourage myself to get up and go. Sometimes it's simply perseverance that makes it. Spiritually, some of you might have started, anybody started a new Bible study this year? Uh, I, I tell people now you can go on your phones and there's incredible apps on here. And if you want to do a short-term study, there's some for like seven days, or there's some for 40 days, or there's some you can read the Bible through in a year kind of thing. All kinds of devotional. We have so much to help us get into the Word and seek God. It's everywhere, but sometimes we might be a little bit more like Da Vinci. We might get started. And I don't say that to guilt you, but I, I really say that to say also this, Get, just get into the Word, how much ever. Get into the Word. If you miss a day, okay. Get into the Word the next day, that night. Just stay in the Word. On Wednesday nights, we're going to, um, uh, in February, we're going to start Disciple Bible Study back, this time going through Luke and Acts. And Acts is one of my favorite books because it's literally the explosion of the Holy Spirit going forth and doing things of God, I mean, by the, by the church. And so I invite you to be part of that study that will be on a Wednesday night as well. Now, as we're talking about seeking God and getting closer to Him, it's interesting that when they, the Magi go to Jerusalem, it seems like they don't see the star, right? Because they end up in Jerusalem, and what are they asking? Where's the one who was born? How is it described? King of the Jews. Now, they might have been like a lot of us. We would have figured the king would have been born in Jerusalem, or maybe this is the spiritual hub and that's where we go. But they go to ask that question, which appears then that the star wasn't always visibly seen. Um, I've I've discovered when I've gone, and I've, I've shared a little of this before, when I've gone to Jamaica and to Belize and to Africa, and we're in places where there's no electricity at all, the stars are amazing. (laughs) Anybody know what I'm talking about? Or if you're just out in the country somewhere here in Kentucky and you look up and and you're in awe at the one who has made all these stars, it's a brilliance that you see. The equator being there. And, and, And I realize now the problem we have here in the city is what's called light pollution, right? And that's artificial light. Because we have so much artificial light, we can't see the real thing. And sometimes the artificial light for me was doing church. That's what it was. 
I didn't know Christ. I was doing church, going, but didn't know Christ. And Christ had to get me out of my normal setting to go to Jamaica so He could be revealed to me. And there was something about I could see Christ in the light of Christ. And I, and, I think for, and, and, and I think we need that. Lord, come. Holy Spirit, we pray. But they get to Jerusalem. And when they get to Jerusalem, Matthew is going to say there's a huge contrast between the Magi seeking Christ, right, and Herod. In fact, if anything, Herod, not only does he not go to worship Christ and doesn't really want to worship, he is against Christ. We call him little a antichrist. That's literally what he was. He wanted to kill Christ. And he was against Christ. Herod was not a nice guy. Herod had killed some of his sons. He had killed his, one of his wives. He had done many things uh, to many people. He had killed others in Jerusalem. And so when he was disturbed at hearing about Jesus and something about this Messiah, the people of Jerusalem would disturb because he was insane and disturbed and crazy. He was literally against Christ. And they'll see that Con, they'll see that contrast. It says this in Scripture, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him were disturbed. And if the king's disturbed, they better be disturbed because he does stuff to them. <laughs> and that's why they were so disturbed. What, what was so disturbing to Herod about Jesus? Well, one, he was a rival to his throne. He was, he was a rival also to his power. He was a rival to his way of life. He was a rival to his control. And a lot of us, man, we, we are control. we got to be in control. And Herod had to be in control. He, Jesus challenged him, or would, his way of life. And he challenges us as well. Herod had no idea who the Messiah was. And so he calls the experts, the chief priests, and he calls the lawyers as well, the scribes. And guess what? They know the answer. He's born in Bethlehem. They know the answer, but what's wrong with that picture is they don't go worship the Messiah. They know the answers. And sometimes we might just know the answer, but it's a whole different thing going to worship the Messiah. Formal knowledge, someone wrote, of the Scripture Matthew implies, does not in itself lead to knowing who Jesus is. And they didn't budge to go worship Jesus, even though they knew the answer. But the Magi, now they've seen the stars, they, the star, they've heard Scripture, and in that, they make a trust decision, we're going <laughs> to Bethlehem. And when they make that decision, guess what reappears? The star. Interesting. We're going to trust Christ, trust God. And the star reappears. And now it leads them exactly to the house, by the way. Mary and Joseph have now found a house. Pation, he's a little child. From Herod's description of wanting to kill the babies two and under, we know he is under two. But he's no longer just the infant. He's, he's a little child. And that's who they are coming to worship and adore. And this is what it says in Scripture. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down. And they, worshiped, and they worshiped Him. They saw His mother Mary, but they only worshiped Jesus Christ. I'm sure they were thankful for Mary, but they worshiped Jesus. And guys, He's the centrality of our worship. Psalmist, Psalm 27, 4 says, One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to do this, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord, and to seek Him in His temple. And they got to gaze on the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in their gazing, they fell down in worship. And, and when it says that they fell and worshipped Him, that meant old Herod, who didn't want to bow and worship Jesus Christ, the ones who knew the answer, who didn't go and bow, they didn't want to give up and, and allow Jesus to be Lord. But the Magi opened their hearts and arms and, and say, Be our Lord. Be our Lord. And we know they, they worshiped Him and gave Him those gifts of gold, the gift of the King. And He wasn't just the King of the Jews now. He was their King, their personal King. And they gave Him the frankincense, which was the incense to, to go up to heaven and please God. And it reminds us that Jesus is our great high priest and our intercessor. And it reminds us that He is divine as well. 
And then the myrrh was the, for, for burial. We shared that a couple of weeks ago. And it all points to the king of kings, not just the Jews, and also to the one who can intercede for us and the one who will die in our behalf. And the wise men came and worshipped. They sought him. And the one thing the Scripture teaches us is if you seek the Lord, if you draw close to him, he will draw close to you as well. And when they had had the Christ experience, they had a willingness to walk a new way. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Um, they were no longer the same people after they had experienced Christ. And they're going to go a different way now. They're not going back the same way that they came. And that's going to take some trust. But we're going to trust you, Jesus, as we follow you, or God, and you show us the way. I want to kind of wrap up those three with this testimony that comes from a professor that was a professor at uh, MIT. And she writes these words. Her name is Dr. Rosalind Picard. She's the founder and director of the Effective Research Group at MIT. She was convinced that she didn't need God or religion. So she declared herself an atheist and dismissed believers as uneducated. But as an educated person, she figured at least she should read the Bible. Kind of interesting. Picard said, when I first opened the Bible, I expected to find phony miracles and an, and an assorted gobbly gook. To my surprise, the book of Proverbs was full of wisdom. I had to pause while reading, and I had to think about it. She read through the entire Bible twice. Now, think about that in the reading of this word. She said, I felt this strange sense of being spoken to. Part of me was increasingly eager to spend time with the God of the Bible, but an irritated voice inside me also insisted I would be happy again once I moved on past this. Another student, in fact, when she was in college, invited her to his church. And the pastor, she said, got her attention when asked, who is the Lord of your life? And this was her answer. I was intrigued. I was the captain of my ship. But was it possible that God would actually be willing to lead me? After praying, Jesus Christ, I ask you to be the Lord of my life, my world changed dramatically. As if a flat, black and white existence suddenly turned full color and three-dimensional. But I lost nothing of my urge to seek new knowledge. In fact, I felt emboldened to ask even tougher questions about how the world works. Today, I work closely with people whose lives are filled with medical struggles. I do not have adequate answers to explain all their suffering, but I know there is a God of unfathomable greatness and love who freely enters into relationship with all who confess their sins and call upon His name. I once thought I was too smart to believe in God. Now I know I was an arrogant fool, her words, who snubbed the greatest mind in the cosmos, the author of all science, of all mathematics, of art, and everything else there is today to know. And then she says these words, Today I walk with joy alongside the most amazing companion anyone could ask for, filled with a desire to keep learning and keep exploring and keep getting to know Jesus in a deeper and a deeper way. The Magi persevered as they sought Jesus. They had to see Him. They had to see Him. And when they saw Him, they worshipped Him and adored Him for who He is. And when they left, they just weren't the same. And they had to trust now God for every step because of going away they hadn't come from before. 2020, folks, we're going to have to trust God who leads every step. We're going to have to be part of travailing prayer. That's prayer when God's heart hurts and our heart hurts and we intercede sometimes for people or we intercede for the lost or we intercede because, Lord, we don't know which way to go. We need your help. And so come. So 2020 is about getting to know Christ in an even deeper way, and deeper way. Get in the Word. It will change your life. In Jesus' name, amen.